Hey, hey, what's going on? Welcome to yet another episode of Angular Air. I'm your host, Justin Schwarzenberger, and today we are going to have a discussion show about NX, NX up here, uh, an open source toolkit for enterprise Angular applications. We have a handful of panelists today. We have a couple of guest panelists or Googleists, and then we have one guest. So let's meet them and get started. Uh, our panelists today, we've got Austin McDaniel. Austin, what's going on? How's everyone doing? I feel like we just did Angular Air <laughs> since we did Friday last week. Yeah, yeah, a Friday show and then a Tuesday show. It happens sometimes, you know, just nonstop Angular, right? <laughs> Bonnie Brennan is with us. What's going on, Bonnie? Whole lot of nada. How y'all doing? Doing good, doing good. We've got uh, Victor Mejia with us today. Victor, how's it going? Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, I know it's been a while, but uh, thanks for having me back. Yeah. Totally. Glad to have you here. Oh, hey, uh, Alyssa Nichols just joined us. Alyssa, uh, you all set to go? Say hi. Hey. All right. I think uh, Mike Brocky's going to be joining us here in a minute as soon as he gets out of his meeting. And then we've got our guest panelists, uh, Jeff and Jesse. How's it going? Hello. Hey, guys. We're actually talking about NX at Capital One today, so uh, we'll have to hey. jump off in a little bit. I just wanted to give Victor a hard time before we go. <laughs> nice. So we're going to be talking NX, and then we also got some NX in the wild, so that's pretty cool. And our uh, guest today, we've got uh, Victor Sacken joining us. Victor, how's it going? All right. Hey, everyone. All right. So uh, NX, well, do you want to start with uh, telling us a little bit about yourself for the viewers that may not know who you are? I'm pretty sure uh, the whole world knows uh, who you are. At least the dev world knows who you are. Uh, sure. Uh, I'm Victor, and I used to be at Google on the Angular team. With Jeff uh, for many years. Uh, so last uh, last year, last December, actually about a year ago, uh, we left the team to start a company called Narwhal, which uh, like Jeff and I and you, Justin, are working at, right? And uh, we will help exactly uh, large enterprise teams uh, to be successful with Angular. That's basically who I am. Cool. Cool. And NX. So what, what's this NX thing? All right. So as you said, NX is an open source toolkit for enterprise Angular apps. And so to be more concrete, right? it's a set of Angular CLI schematics or generators, sort of linters, and a set of runtime libraries. Uh, and all of it uh, is built to sort of eliminate a lot of uh, uh, complexities and uh, hurdles that teams face when they start building large Angular applications. Uh, yeah, that's basically what NX is. And uh, it, it's a result of, uh, of Jeff and I and the rest of the Narrow uh, team are working with a lot of enterprise clients. And so we work with all those clients and uh, they have the same set of requirements or like similar set of requirements because most of our clients are large companies with many teams building many, many applications that are composed of many different libraries. So we organize the same dev workflow many, many times. And at, at some point we decided to sort of formalize it or create a tool that makes this workflow Slightly, or like somewhat simpler, right? And that's what NX is. So, what and does uh, NX include? So, it's a set of schematics, but you know, what what all does that include? All right, cool. Uh, so, just like if you don't know, the Angular CLI starting with one point five, I think, is uh, sort of pluggable, right? You can customize what CLI generates or how CLI works to a fairly large degree. Uh, so, and uh, Mike, who is over there, and Hans from the Angular CLI team help us to use this pluggable mechanism to implement NX. Uh, so essentially, the set of schematics is what we can tell the CLI to generate. Right? When you start a new, uh, a new project by default, oh, it, it wasn't introduced in 1.4. Thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, so when you start a new project by default, uh, the CLI will set up your project for you, create a source folder, create a bunch of TS configs for you, create a Karma file for you. And it works for many, many apps. right? So we, we change that to provide a custom schematic that uh, sets up your project in a different way, right? So instead of having one source folder, we actually create two folders for apps and lips. So you can put many apps and all, all your apps in one folder and put all your libraries, the usual pieces of code you want to use across many apps into your lips folder, right, for example. Uh, then you can generate new apps and lips, right? If you want to uh, create a new endpoint, something that you can serve, like an application, like a binary, right? You would run ng-generate app, my app, 
which uh, this schematic we provide, and the CLI would create all the necessary files uh, while it wired up in all uh, configuration files and place those files into the app uh, folder so we can start serving the app and working with it. You can do the same as a library. You can run ng generate lib my lib and pass a bunch of flags, and uh, the CLI will use our schematic, you know, the blueprint, so to speak, to uh, to create all the necessary files, wire it up, update whatever is necessary to make sure that the library can be used by other libraries or like applications in your uh, in your what we call workspace, right? Uh, in addition to that, right? In addition to sort of laying out the apps and lib structure, yes, and making that stuff work. Uh, we provide schematics that make state management much simpler, like sort of conventions for state management, routing, and uh, upgrade, and lots of other things. So those those apps that you can generate, that those mm -hmm. apps are like similar to the app that you get in the Angular CLI project view ng new, right? Right. Yeah, they're very similar to that. So they have a very very similar structure. There is a little bit of variation because, understandably, we uh, what we create is slightly different here and there, right? We uh, for example, provision and next runtime libraries in those apps are sort of out of the box because we think they're useful for most applications, right? Uh, but essentially, if you imagine the Angular CLI project, that's basically what an app is. So an app is something you can serve, something you can build with Webpack, something you can distribute to like users to, to run in the browser, right? And that's what an app is. So you have your apps, and then you have a libs folder, and that's is that like all your shared? So does it, it loads all the node modules? for all the apps, and then they just pull out what they need? Uh, so the libs folder, uh, there is a libs folder. And libs, uh, the libs folder is used not just for shared code. We actually recommend to use it for all your code, right? So everything that you build, all your application logic goes in the libs folder as well, even if it's not shared. And we recommend to use the apps folder sort of uh, just to configure the environment in which your application runs, right? To hook up a few things, run main, boot your application, and that's basically it. Right, uh, so we recommend actually like 99% of your code to place in the libs folder, and then just that 1%, the environment, sort of the shell, the set of capabilities your libs have to have to function, right, uh, to put in the apps folder. Uh, so sort of think of like a configuration is what an app is, like a platform that you know where you run it, right? Whereas libs is all your real code, right? And when it comes to node modules, uh, we can talk about it right now in a second, but. Uh, uh, NX, uh, when we generate a new workspace with NX, this new project where you can create apps and libs, uh, we do it in a mono repo like fashion, meaning that, right, all your apps and libs are in the same repo and all of them uh, share the same set of node modules or the same node modules folder, right? Uh, meaning that there is a single node modules directory in the whole workspace that all apps and libs use. So, so I know there's a, oh, so, sorry, Mike. Go ahead, go ahead. No. I know there's a concept of uh, like apps. Um, so what what do you think is the deciding factor of making something either a new route in your current application or just making a new app for it? Right. Uh, so I would say uh, so this is uh, it's not like a business decision per se, but it can be right. And in general, for most companies, if you talk to most businesses, what they want is having a single app experience at least, right? Having a single experience where you go and it feels like it's one app. Right, so when you navigate between sections, even if those sections are distinct, right, and used by different categories of users, they still want it to feel like one app. So you like you sign in once, and you can click around, you know, and it doesn't feel like you're switching between different applications, right? So I, th I think most often than not, uh, you ended up with having uh, like a portal-like app. If you are like a, if, for example, building a, a sort of a large system for a particular business, right? Where you want to create a separate app when it comes to Nexus, if you have a different platform. Let's say you have a one port of like app that you run for desktop, and if you want to have a separate version for mobile, uh, which is composed differently, maybe have different, uh, you, like a composed of different modules, doesn't have all the capabilities, uh, you know, uh, maybe you use different router preloading strategies there, right? Uh, you'll have a separate app for mobile. Uh, but usually, uh, you, you should start with going having multiple routes, where every capability is expressed as a lazy loadable module slash a route, but rather than a separate application. So the way I look at the difference between a conventional Angular CLI application and an NX uh, structure is that the Angular CLI aims to be a generic 
platform to be able to to develop applications, whereas NX takes it a step further and has an opinionated way of how to structure an application right. and take some of those learnings that you've had uh, through your career of writing Angular applications of, right. hey, this is how we recommend you create and structure an Angular application. Yeah, well, this is 100%, uh, I like, agree with 100%. The reason why we can go further and generate like more stuff and configure it and provide runtime libraries in a way that we do is because we basically focus on a smaller set of applications. We are saying like, if you are a large business and you are building multiple apps and you have like, I don't know, a, a few dozen libraries or reusable pieces you want to compose into those apps, right? We know a lot more about how to structure your dev workflow, right? If you are to use like, because we know that chances are you're going to use complex state management because you're building so many apps, there is a lot of state, a lot of communication with the backend. And as such, we can just choose to use NGRX for state management, right? And not even choose to use NGRX, but the particular way of using NGRX that we know in our experience works well for many, many clients, right? But because we are focusing on smaller sort of like applications and companies, uh, we can provide more. Uh, the CLI is more generic, which it should be, right? It should be a generic tool, like the default CLI project you create, should be a generic tool because if you start like hacking on a weekend, you know, uh, just to play with the CLI, you don't want to deal with multiple apps and multiple leaps and think about state management and think about the exactly right way of using the router, right? That's just not what your concern, like what your concerns are, right? If you are building a large set of apps for like a giant company, right? You should think about those things, and that's where where next uh, uh, comes into play. Right, but I don't I don't think you should sell yourself short there. I don't think that it's necessarily only for large corporations. I think even right. if you're a one stop shop where you have a single application, it's still right. a good way to structure and to um, organize your code within even a single application. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That, that's true. There is a little bit more structure, so a little bit more to get used to, right? Uh, but for example, the site, the narrow that I/O site that we have, right? is in an X uh, workspace. Even though if you look at it, it's like, okay, there is not much to it. It's like a site with a few tabs and like a doc section, right? It should like, like we didn't have to use an X, but it didn't hurt. Yes, I think it made the app, like all the structure, the source code, a little bit more manageable. So do you see these organizations actually having like, using like a mono repo for all of their different business units together and, and sharing these components? Right. Or is it kind of just you know my application or my business unit at my organization and right. you might have a totally different you know type thing? Right. So uh, that's a good question, and uh, I can uh, let me first talk a little bit about what what a mono repo is, just just to make sure we are on the same page and uh, uh, so the viewers know what we're talking about, uh, and then I will answer uh, uh, the, uh, the question. So essentially, one of the parts, the core parts, or the most interesting parts of Annex is what we call the next workspace, which is a set of schematics to generate apps and leaps in the initial structure. And it's done in a way that is like a monorepo-like way, right? The, the, the word monorepo uh, is used so broadly these days, so it's very hard to see what exactly it's meant. But what I mean here is that you will place many apps and many leaps in the same repository, right? And they're going to share the same context, meaning the same set of third-party dependencies. If one app is using Angular 5.1, all the apps have to use Angular 5.1, right? That's basically the set of constraints. Why is it good, right? Why are we recommending, or why are we uh, like offering this uh, this way of building like multiple apps? Uh, we think it works well for for a lot of scenarios because it uh, gives you the following advantages. Yes, the first one is uh, you always know that everything at a particular point or commit works together, right? You check out a particular commit, you know that all your libraries and your apps are consistent because you, all your tests run across the libraries and apps. Right, uh, it's easier to split your code from uh, like take a chunk of code in your app and pull it out to share thing that you do somewhere else. It takes minutes, right? And if you don't use the mono repo, if you have like a gazillion of uh, GitHub repos, uh, it, uh, it doesn't take minutes. Okay, it may take days depending on how complex the CI process is and stuff like that. Right? Uh, dependency management is simpler because there is one node modules folder, and what like people think that it's uh, not as important, but it's crucial. Every single client we, uh, that have a lot of different repos, if you look at it, and then you go to not modules folder of uh, like an app or something they ship, and you search for say name colon RxJS, you'll find like a few RxJS is there, right? A few TypeScripts. It's like uh, it, it's surprisingly common to have this semi-chaotic way of organizing dependencies, right? Uh, using Yarn or NPM. 
Uh, so all this stuff is, is nicer because of the Mona Lipa approach, right? Uh, you can uh, refactor multiple apps, you can do all the things, right? At companies like Google, uh, this position of like, let's refactor multiple apps and let's have this one set of dependencies is taken to the extreme. They have all the, all this, not all the, but most of their source code in a single repository, right? They published white papers about it, so you can Google it and see why exactly they, they're doing it this way. So they have like billions of lines of code in the same repo that they manage. Because they have that much code, right? They have to have special build tools, special source control and whatnot, you know, all these tools carefully crafted, you know, uh, to make that happen, right? And we can talk about Basil maybe later uh, to see, you know, how exactly they do it. Uh, so a company can go this way and just say, we are going to be like Google, right? We are going to put all this source code in the same repo. Uh, but I think in reality, it's a, a lot harder than people, uh, uh, think as best, right? Uh, partially for organizational reasons. If you have an organization with, say, two separate lines of business, those two lines of business may not want to have anything in the same repo, right? Well, one reason is that they can have different funding, right? And as such, you say, we are going to fund our own apps over here, right? Because we have our own, you know, budget and stuff. Uh, we're paying for our own CI. Why would we pay for your CI, right? So just that reason alone can make it impossible to put all the source code or all the front end code or even all angle apps in the same repo, right? What is often more feasible, immediately possible is to say one line of business or like a few lines of business that are sort of in agreement can have their own one repo, right? Or like their own repository for their angle apps and maybe have a couple or a dozen angle apps there, right? Not all the source code in the organization, just a lot of it, right? And have maybe, 20 libraries or whatever in, in the same repo, so they can uh, enjoy these benefits and they can depend on other code, uh, like let's say if there is a certain, like a, a package of shared components, they can depend on it in a way that you would usually depend on via package.json, right? They can put in a package.json, just say, we pretend or like we assume that that dependency comes from outside, but everything else within our repo, you know, gets all the nice benefits I talked about. So most often than not, you cannot put all the code in the same repo almost now works, I would say, for other organizations, at least not right away. But it is possible to put like uh, sort of a lot of closely connected apps, usually built by the same line of, like in the same line of business, right? And so uh, th these apps, we talked a little bit about earlier, like uh, is it, it's not creating anything super unique for people in terms of the app itself of like it's not like you said it's it, it there's some dependency libraries and stuff like that right. but under the hood is pretty much like an angular cli app yeah so you're kind of you know if companies take on and make the decision on nx getting you, you kind of get you're getting angular cli configured in a way that supports multiple apps and libs right. but um you're not necessarily like locking yourself into something super proprietary right oh, yeah so like the uh, uh, nx in general is not like I mean, first it's like open source or whatnot, so there is no vendor locking in this way, and the, like it's under MIT license. But in principle, you can have an open source, an open source lock, right? If you are using an open source project which is very specific, and you invest like you know five years and uh, hundreds of developer year time, you know, into building stuff with that project, you know, it's very hard to you know opt out. That is true. Uh, so intentionally, yes, we are trying to be as close to the where possible to the standard CLI setup, you know, so. Uh, for a couple of reasons. The main one is that if you want to, let's say, move a library outside of an X and publish it separately, uh, like nothing else in the configuration of that, right? You just do it, the rest of your workspace works exactly the same way. If you want to move an app out, right? Well, you have to provide the libraries you need. You know, so if you publish those via NPM, it's great, right? But again, you can do it. Uh, you can even align these libraries if you want to. And uh, it should just, like, it should be a matter of hours, you know, if you're able to, like, publish those libraries to NPM, right? Uh, intentionally, right? So even the part of the CLI, the default CLI setup, I personally uh, not a big fan of. I think the CLI is a great tool, right? But everyone has different preferences, right? But choosing between what Victor wants and what is a standard CLI, we went with the standard CLI all the time, right? Uh, except uh, TS Lint, which we can talk about in, if you want in a second, right? Uh, but then we actually relaxed it. Yes, we made it more permissive. Uh, so we are trying to uh, be basically as close to the standard CLI where possible, right? Within an app, it feels like the standard CLI. If you generate a new component inside, let's say, a library, right? Uh, the way it's laid out, the way it looks, the task to generate, uh, 
basically the standard CLI uh, files and tests. So it, it feels very CLI-like. For this variance, we are familiar, so it's easier to jump into an accident and be productive like in an hour. But also, if for some reason it doesn't work for you, or let's say uh, you start to get then one line of business or one team decides to build the app in a separate repo and do it entirely differently uh, for organizational reasons because of some rework stuff, they can do it and they can do it in like in hours, right? So. So I think that's, that. that's an important point, really quick, uh, because it's opinionated, right, right, in some of the things that it brings, but it's not like lock-in opinionated. Right. So I don't know, sometimes right. it's kind of hard for people to discern the difference between the two, right? Right, that's true. So you can opt out. First of all, most of the things that even we are opinionated about, like state management, right, for example, uh, you can say, you know what, I actually do not like NGRX. You know, I have a strong, which I think if we have a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, you'll change your mind. Uh, but if for some reason you know you don't have it, uh, you don't like you don't feel the need to use NGRX, uh, so you sort of stuck in this, you know, uh, with this false or like wrong opinion. That's fine. You don't have to, right? You can just say I'm going to use more backs for Angular, and it's good for you, right? The rest of it should work just fine, right? So uh, you're talking about it's opinionated and things like that. What if I've already got an Angular app? With the CLI, how hard is it to migrate? Right. Uh, so, in, uh, because we want more people to use it right away, right? Uh, we have a schematic that you can run uh, that works for many apps. Like, if you have a very convoluted setup, you know, and your app have been evolving for years, right? It may not work right away. Uh, but if you go to Angular CLI uh, in your Angular CLI project, you just install uh, the narrow schematics dependency, and then you run ng generate workspace something you know uh, like name right you provide a name it would change your setup to be the workspace app it will rearrange all the files it will create the apps folder it, it will put the source code you have into the apps folder change all the ts configs in a way that's needed like touch the protractor configuration file just a little bit to make it uh you know uh uh work you know with the workspace so it basically to change it into a workspace like instantly uh, if you have a very convoluted setup, once again, right, it may not work instantly. Like a, a thing may be not working exactly right somewhere, right? Uh, but overall, for most apps, you know, it should be you run a command, boom, you have a workspace in place. Right? But so just to make it, you, you, you recommend uh, committing first, and also make sure that you have comprehensive tests. <laughs> Right, yeah, I, that, that is a, a key point, right? Uh, I think it's why the schematics are so much safer. Uh, then we can talk about, by the way, how we migrate uh, versions of an X from older to newer ones. Why there are so much, like, A, like schematics are built really wonderfully, but that's sort of be, beside the point. Uh, even if they were built in a crappy way, right? Uh, like, which they are not, right? But imagine they were like super crappy mutation stuff in place, you know, trans transacting the, like, probably a bad idea, but you know, like doing a lot of damage, right, to your repo because you can always commit. And then run it, and then see what the hell has happened after you run it. Like there is no risk, you know. You run it, you look at the diff. The diff seems legit. You run the test, test run, it's great. If you look at it, the diff doesn't seem legit, you know. I mean, undo, right? <laughs> so it's easy, right? I'm, I'm genuinely surprised on folks. Like I'm not sure if I should do it. Like you risk nothing, right? Uh, you by crossing the street, you're taking a much higher risk of being hit by a car than by running uh, in generate workspace, you know my workspace that's the quote of the show right there <laughs> <laughs> right so uh but yeah so i uh, for, just to like jump on on that as well so uh one thing i want to add so it's not just switching to workspaces so easy right you can run a command there it works the test run and stuff like that uh moving from a one version of workspace to a different version of workspace like let's say we have an x 0.3 and we release a newer one uh, like in half a year, right? And you want to use that one. Uh, we can change some stuff around, right? Uh, which might break you, right? In, in principle, you can break your project. Not to break your project. We actually write migrations uh, uh, that will run automatically to adjust your project, to match the new versions of Workspace, the new versions of the CLI, the new versions of Angular. So a lot of things that, uh, like if you're upgrading from an X0.3 to let's say 0.5, you run and you run an X migrate, and we update your project so it works, right? And again, before doing that, commit, make sure everything runs, run it, make sure everything runs. But we are trying to make it this process not just moving to the workspace, but also evolving your project as we release new versions of an X and workspace. Uh, effortless, always effortless as it can be, right? Sometimes, uh, obviously, things fall apart, you know, but 
Uh, most often than not, they don't. You know, and, and, and you can like move from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 again in seconds. So you talked about all the really cool stuff that it does today. What's on the roadmap? Uh, a lot of stuff on the roadmap. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, we care about deeply, uh, so deeply, is uh, the basil. So as you can see, I'm wearing the basil t-shirt, uh, which Alex Ego uh, gave me. Uh, a big fan of basil. So what is basil, right? So uh, basil is a build tool uh, that uh, uh, it doesn't like sort of used internally by Google. That's not exactly true. They have a different version of the build tool, but you know, just ignoring the details. It's a build tool used by Google to build that billion lines of code they have, right? Uh, and it's great for monorepos, right? It has very nice properties. You can build not just front end code with it, but also back end code like Java, .NET, C++, Go, whatever you want. And I think it works well. You know, a lot of properties basically provides a really, really nice, especially for large organizations. If you have a small project, you know, it doesn't really matter. The bigger your project goes, the more projects you have, right? Uh, the more it matters how you build stuff. And um, so we got involved with Bezo uh, some time ago, uh, maybe like half a year ago. I mean, we used it at Google while working at Google, right? Uh, but we decided to make it uh, nicer for, for, for our clients, right? So we forked the CLI. Uh, with help from Mike and Hans uh, to to see if we can make it work with Bezo, right? And we did make it work with Bezo, but it wasn't exactly right. Uh, so we sort of back out a little bit and decided to wait for a little bit till the Bezo Angular integration is a little bit more smooth. So soon, because uh, we hired a lot of people who know a lot of Bezo, a lot of Bezo work is happening. Soon the Bezo Angular integration is going to be fantastic. It's already pretty good, but it's going to be fantastic. And when this happens, we are going to have a Bezo backed version of an X. Uh, and there is some changes in the CLI that must happen. So basically, a lot of moving parts. Once all these parts, you know, come into play, you know, and aligned and whatnot, you're able, to, you'll be able to use uh, Basil to build your labs and apps and stuff like that. And uh, the way NX is laid out right now is all these apps and labs is sort of uh, really Basil friendly, right? So partially why we are doing it is to enable the usage of Basil uh, in the future. So that's one part. That's not coming uh, next week, you know, but hopefully. Early next year, we will have something in place. Uh, another thing is the CI integration. So right now, if you create a new next project, you need to figure out how to set up CI. Uh, like Circle, Travis, or let's say, uh, I don't know, Jenkins, right? And uh, uh, it, it's not extremely difficult to do it. Uh, but to do it right actually requires effort, right? For example, to make sure that you run all the checks, that formatting is done properly, that you run the test properly, that when you have those apps and lips and you change your lip, you only run things that's needed, you know, things like that, right? Uh, so we are going to automate a big part of that. Uh, so the, the hope is that you'll be able to create your next workspace, run a command, pick the CI provider you like, connect it on that side, and then you'll have a nice CI process in place, right? Uh, for a lot of smaller companies that uh, maybe don't, don't have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people who can spend like weeks and weeks, you know, uh, polishing the ACI, right? That can be a, a huge thing. But even for large companies, because of how inconsistent everything is often at large companies, having a consistent way to do CI can be very beneficial, right? Uh, another thing is, uh, this is mostly like for Windows folks, uh, but not only, uh, is to provide a little bit more ID and editor integration, All right? Right now, uh, there is CLI support, let's say, in, uh, in WebStorm, which works fine. Uh, but because we have a more specific structure of the workspace, and we sort of can assume a lot more, right? We can actually build more automation when it comes to ID. Uh, for example, if you look at a particular library, we know exactly what other libraries use it, what apps use it. So we have this dependency graph, we can visualize and provide some refactorings on top of, right? So we are going to learn some of this uh, and lots of lots of other things. Uh, this three, uh, you know, uh, the more exciting ones, I think. And some of that stuff that we learn as people start using it, right? And All right, figure right. out what they're hitting, what things we need to tweak. That's right. Of... All right. Yeah, we are constantly refining it. Uh, for example, uh, pretty much every single client we uh, interact with has a lot of issues with setting up router and lazy loading, and it's my fault uh, because it should have been better designed. But it's designed the way it's designed, and it cannot change because it's breaking change, right? So we just accept it, right? That it's like that. So what can we do, right? Uh, we can just disallow certain patterns by writing link checks and just you just cannot do that, right? So when you generate a new lib and you say, I want to generate router configuration, lazy loading, 
pass the parent module, we can configure everything for you that works, but also prevent you from screwing it up. Uh, because it's so easy to import a lazy loadable library, right? By accident, because you want some interface, suddenly you got some constant there because you just want to see it. People do it all the time. And then what happens, Webpack will fold it in into your main chunk, right? Uh, because the import is there, it has to be physically present in the main chunk. That's probably not what you meant, right? So uh, we will, like we already disallow that. If you go there, you know, you just will err saying like, it's a lazy loadable library. If you do this, like everything will be bad, you know, you'll get a divorce, your company will go broke. Uh, like just don't do that, right? Uh, so things like that we are trying to do because we just see it being repeated over and over and over again, right? Uh, Another thing is, uh, oh, yeah, the code formatting. Jesus Christ, every single company we uh, looked at screw up, uh, 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 not screw up, but have inconsistent looking code, right? And what you learn at working at any like large software company is that those things can be automated like, like this, right? Uh, you shouldn't make a decision how to format your code, right? You just, you, you shouldn't be able to. You should just look the same way across the whole organization, right? It seems like a small thing, but in reality, it's not. The neighbors sort of think it's a lot easier to look at the code. It just like it's a lot better if you do it this way, as Prak has showed, right? So, like, we look at it, we see it's inconsistent, we're just forcing you to format code in a way we like. So, uh, you know, yeah, so we're basically looking at what company struggle is and trying to eliminate the pain and do it in a way that uh, surgical. What I mean by that is uh, what I'm scared of, and I'm scared of many things, but mainly of uh, writing a lot of code that I have to maintain. Uh, yeah, we use Prettier, just as a, uh, like, we do use Prettier to format the code. Uh, uh, basically, writing a lot of code that I have to maintain, because then I cannot change it, it's hard to, you know, like, it, it's basically a headache, right? So everything we do, we're trying to do, like, what can we achieve? How can we, like, uh, alleviate the pain? Just make it easier with, like, 50 lines of code. You know, there's something that is small enough to be easily maintainable, so if I want to rewrite, I can rewrite it, uh, but still, like, get rid of like 80% of the pain. Because usually that's how it is. You know, you can see that if I just do it a little bit over here, like I'll have so many people, you know, and I just like do it with like 200 lines of code, right? So we have every single problem we're addressing is like we're trying to see how can we do it so it's like super small, right? Solution is so simple that you can actually read through the code, right? And see what the hell is happening there. So it's got, you know, you just mentioned you know, there's some additional linting stuff that NX provides, right. as well as a formatter that NX, that NX provides as well, right? Right, right. Yeah. And so these things are on top of what we already discussed, what you brought up with in terms of the whole workspace and the apps and the loops, right? right? So you right. Have that, like the linter and the formatter that comes there. Um, and then, uh, so what else do we have? Um, state management stuff? Right, I can talk about state management. So state management is super hard, as we know. I mean, the, the source of... Uh, the sadness in, in many people's lives, right? Uh, why is that hard? Because any front-end app uh, is a like a concurrent distributed system, but lots of things are happening at once. You're talking to the backend, things are being like flying around, lots of requests and whatnot, right? And uh, as a result, uh, uh, like everyone gets it wrong. Like I'm not even exaggerating. Every single app I looked at has a lot of race conditions and bugs due to state management set up incorrectly. Every single one, without any exception. Even like if I look at a do app and I ask someone to go to to do app that actually talks to the backend, I guarantee you that like that app will have race conditions and bugs. It is that hard to get it right. It is surprisingly difficult, right? Or unsurprisingly difficult, depending on uh, what you think, right? Uh, so NGRX is a good sort of mechanism to make it less hard, right? But it's very generic in the sense that it provides a few low level primitives you can use to build your state management solution, right? But by itself, it doesn't. Uh, sort of give you that much, right? So we take NGRX and we use it in a particular way, right? In an opinionated way, so to speak, right? So uh, we just use it in a particular way. Uh, we lay it out for you so you uh, avoid the most costly mistakes, right? For example, when talking to the backend, we just provide a thing that you have to call to talk to the backend that gets rid of a lot of race conditions, right? We set up typing for you, right? Because again, it's often when you look at the app that uses NGRX, you see that uh, because folks aren't familiar with TypeScript, you know? They don't stop typing right, so like nothing is type checked or whatnot, right? We do it in a way that sort of works for a lot of folks, right? And um, and again, we generate the you know it's lazy and friendly, so it's done in a way that sort of works well for many many clients. Uh, that's one of the things. And so it's a set of schematics that generate that 
NGRX initial code in this way. And then it's mm -hmm. also some helper library code that allows you to solve those race conditions and things like with effects and right. things like that. Right, right, right. Pull it all together, the combination of those two. All right. So it is a set of schematics, as you pointed out. So blueprints to generate the source code, a set of runtime libraries to do race conditions, but not only to fix the race conditions. And also we provide some test utilities. We also generate tests in a somewhat opinionated way with some uh, utilities that make writing tests uh, slightly simpler. Uh, for example, if you look at effects that are very uh, RxJS heavy or observable heavy, right? Testing those, uh, uh, and if you are like really into NGRX, you have like hefty effects, you know, that sort of, you know, not easy to understand sometimes. Uh, testing those in an elegant way uh, requires some discipline. So we generate some stuff for you and provide some utilities to make it simpler. For example, we set up marbles, some utilities to, uh, to write your test in a semi linear way. So you'll have a lot of nesting, you know, so they read nicely and stuff like that. Cool. Um, so I have a question about uh, some of the opinionated stuff, right? And, and when we talk about NGRX and we talk about um, actions and right. these, you know, actions being interfaces or classes or action creators, right. uh, NX has a way that it does in the schematics that it generates right. in a certain way, right? And, and that's right. the opinionated way. What, right. um, you know, how, how are you going to tackle the challenges of obviously people, you know, posting issues and asking you saying, oh, we want it to be this way or we do these that way. Like, can you throttle back right. or like, like, is it, how much of a, is it a challenge so far? And, you know, if not, what's the right. expectation going forward of how to, how to tackle that and make the community yeah. happy and still deliver NX, right? Right. So certain things definitely, uh, like certain, uh, things we can do lux, right? Uh, we started with a specific way of doing things. And uh, let's say the community or like a lot of people are voting for making one piece of it a little bit more flexible. It's not like I actually in my organization, we just have it so like, can we change it one piece, right? Uh, in this case, I can use it. Other, otherwise I have to manually uh, fix it every time I generate my state management, right? And uh, if the change is small and it seems reasonable, like it doesn't, uh, like I think it's fine, right? We, uh, we are happy to accommodate and make the schematic slightly more flexible, you know, to allow for that variability. In general, though, I think the value comes from the absence of variability, right? So uh, people like configuration and variability because they feel like oh, I can configure it in any way I want, you know. And uh, but in reality, that's not what you want, or like that's not what you need, right? That's what you want, but it's not what you need. You feel like it will make you more productive and your organization more successful. In reality, that's probably not the case, right? And I think it's it, like it's similar to if you look at the CLI and let's say manually wiring up a web app which is uh, like you can do it manually and webpack is great, right? Uh, and you often want to because you feel like, well, I have to have this, you know, but in reality, uh, I think at least my experience, it's, uh, if you use the CLI, you're better off, right? In the long run. Yeah, certain things will not be exactly uh, the way you expect, you know, uh, but that's fine, right? Uh, because in the long run, you're going to win by following something which is uh, standard or whatever, the sameness. Being the same has a lot of value, right? Uh, uh, because you're basically experiencing less pain from being like being special, right? And having your setup done in a very special way, right? So we had, I'm uh, personally against of having variability, right? having one way that personally may offend you, but persevere, right? Accept the way, and even though it like at first it hurts to see this, like that character that you don't like or whatever, summer in that, in two years you'll be happy because if you have an organization and with ten teams building twenty apps. All of them have exactly the same character in exactly the same spot, which has a lot of value, right? Variability is uh, the bigger thing that kills productivity, right? Not having variability is like is the greatest thing, right? Just having one way of doing things that works, I think in the long run is better, right? Having standardization is better. Uh, having said that, sometimes you want some variability. Like Pretty is a good example. Pretty is an opinionated code formatter. It just does format your code in a particular way, right? You can say, I actually like it in a different way. Screw you, like pretty does in a particular way. But because some people have, like some things are still required, right? They have a few flags you can pass. But the number of flags is very limited. So overall, right? Pretty does from what you code in a particular way with just a little bit of variability. So overall, it's, it's usable. And how easy it is to use prettier than say, like a traditional code formatting tool. We have like this sub giant JSON file with 50 different options you need to toggle in all sorts of ways. Like all your projects look different. It, it's a nightmare, right? Just having one way that you sort of agree with, you know, it's better. So 
the way that's why I personally like prettier or clang clang format the same way right uh, I like prettier for that very reason and that's why I think that we should try to do the same right avoid variability unless we have to introduce it I think that's one of those challenges of, for us as developers, right? Is always like looking at it and going, well, we want to build something, right? We have this cool right. concept of what we want to build, but we get caught up so much in the pieces that are needed to pull that off and like wanting right. control right. over those things and like making those right. decisions. Right. And at the end of the day, what we really want to do is we want to build this cool thing. So can we just get all these other things to help make that happen and then focus right. all of our energy on decision making and making the cool thing? Right. I think that's kind of what you're referring to. Exactly. Exactly. So basically, uh, to sort of uh, uh, to say it in a, in a, in the same thought, but in a way that uh, like I usually communicate it, uh, is if you look at a problem, right, or like building an app, you can say that there are a set of uh, problems or challenges that are generic. Not to your app, they're generic to a set of apps, maybe to lots of enterprise apps, or even to most Angular apps. And there is a set of challenges that's specific to your app. Like if you're building an app to rent out, I don't know, uh, some apartments or whatever, or like to, to find, uh, to do cat matching, so you can have cat dates, right? Uh, for your cat, right? If you're building that app, that's what you need to focus on. Yes, like everything cat related is your app, setting up your build process is not your app, right? So the, the goal of an X to a large degree is to clearly divide in what's unique to your application slash your business uh, from what's not and taking care of the latter, right? So you can focus on what's unique to your application. You can build your app quickly, go fast to market, you know, release it, you know, and be productive and not worrying too much, you know, about like, okay, now I have, you know, to figure out how to maintain this config, which is 5,000 lines long that manages my build that I do not understand. And then like, you know, someone else comes to the team, screws up my config. Now no one understands it. You know, it's not tested because build config is usually untested. We are afraid to touch it because if we touch it, we know that, you know, like someone somewhere dies because our app actually powers the hospital, right? It's like, uh, it's and a that, horrible that situation. Exactly, you have a city full of single cats, not getting any dates and, you exactly. know, not helping anybody. Yeah. yeah. No, no, we don't want that. Right. So, uh, I think that. Uh, focus on what you need to your business. So every time you make it, like I was thinking, I'm going to spend a week doing it. Ask yourself, am I working on something that's unique to my business or I'm doing technical, uh, how do I say it? Uh, uh, basically, I'm just enjoying myself by playing with this piece of technology, right? And the reality is that uh, a lot of developers, myself included, we like to play with pieces of technology. Like, I just want to hook it up over here, figure it out. Uh, but it's, it's not what makes your business successful, right? So uh, you can play with it, right? Uh, that's fine. But most often they know that's the wrong decision, right? You want to use something that works. For example, the CLI works really well. And next is basically CLI on a lot of steroids with a bunch of runtime stuff on top of it, right? And uh, focus on your app, right? On something that Mike cannot provide, right? Mike can provide the CLI. I can uh, provide an X, right? Uh, we, can, we don't build cat-related uh, Angular software yet. Uh, it, it's on my to-do list. Um, actually, when you said that, I was actually just letting the cat out of my office. Uh, right. <laughs> so I, I think two things. One, I think that there's going to be some Victor memes that come out of this episode, <laughs> over the, some of the lines and some of the quotes that you have here. I think mm -hmm. we'll have a few Victor memes. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to set you off with a question here that if somebody wants to be a little bit more opinionated, because so at, at, we established that NX is a more opinionated Angular structure over what the right. CLI provides. Right. If somebody decides to be even more opinionated, uh, to um, have some specific, I don't know, implementations, customizations on top of NX, is that possible? Right. Yeah, uh, totally. So uh, one way to do it, you know, I mean, the simplest way which most organizations start with, is like, okay, like, we, we establish sort of guidelines, and uh, let's say it will be like an architect review and stuff. Okay, that kind of works, right? And I think it's a good first step. If you want to explore and say, we are going to, let's say, manage our backend in a particular way, right? Every interaction with the backend will be wrapped up in a particular service uh, with certain sort of, you know, uh, uh, things around it that manage errors in a particular way, let's say, right? That's fine. So you do it for a while and then you're like, okay, we, we tried it for a few months in a bunch of apps, it works well. How can we formalize it, right? Make it something that you can reproduce, do it without some senior super architect getting involved and fixing up your stuff every time you do it, right? Without you having to copy, copy and paste, right? And in this case, like, you probably should create a custom schematic, right, and register it. Uh, creating a schematic is easy, easy to test, you know? It's one of the, actually, like, probably my favorite part of the CLI is just using schematics for generating stuff because it actually is straightforward. 
So you, you create a custom schematic, uh, you re, like you publish it, you know, as a sort of schematics for your organization. Uh, you use it to generate, let's say, this particular type of service. You know, let's say you have like a, uh, I don't know, a login setup uh, so you can log stuff to the backend. You know, you have to do it every single time. You have to have some source code component to it, right? Like you need to generate some stuff. Create a schematic, generate your schematic. And then if you need a runtime component, the schematic can use the runtime component. I think that that formalization is an important step where a lot of companies uh, sort of stop. They don't do it, right? They have sort of guidelines that are supposed to be sort of monitored by architects or senior people. But in reality, it almost always falls through, right? Because uh, someone falls asleep, then two architects don't agree. Like, there is all the variations. Like, it's kind of similar to that stuff. So we know what happens, right? Over time, it degrades to something that is very specific to a particular unit, right? If you have a schematic or like have a tool, just this is what you're supposed to be writing when you talk to the backend, for example, to do login, uh, you do it, and then it's a lot more likely uh, to remain the same. Or reproducible, you know. So, if you want to to do that, you know, to make your organization uh, basically do what NX does, but even more so, right? Creating schematics with a runtime component on the side is a great way to do. It. So, essentially, instead, you're telling organizations instead of hiring a super angular architect, right. use NX, and then essentially you are their super architect. Yeah, I mean that's. Uh, I mean, I did via, via the NX schematics. Yeah, the uh, the organization that is that part of it, right? If you use a sort of convention the community came up with, you know, a lot of decisions have been made for you, and probably people thought about those decisions very hard, right? So chances are it actually works. That's why I think partially why uh, like Ruby and Rails, which I have a love and hate relationship with, was so successful, right? Uh, because it did think like things a particular way, and lots of companies became successful because of that, right? They were able to like quickly stamp out absolute like, dates, right? Uh, we're, I'm not saying it's the same as Ruby but that same component of we are providing a set of decisions that works well for a particular set of clients. And if you're that client, just use it and it's a good default, it's a good starting point. But at some point you have a special app that's just very, very special for some reason and you have to use something else, that's fine, right? Uh, but other than that, you know, like, yeah, so using the set of convention the community came up with is a good, is a good starting point. So you don't have to spend your time and energy deciding the same set of things. So uh, there's information out there, right, about NX. People can learn more, check right. out stuff. Right. So you can uh, go to narrow.io slash NX and uh, read the docs, watch the videos. And uh, uh, you know, if you go to blog at narrow.io, our blog, you can find a bunch of blog posts about NX as well. There is a talk we gave at, uh, Jeff and I gave at uh, Angular Mix, Mix, I think. Mix. So yeah, check it out over there. And uh, um, a lot more to come, right? In the next couple of uh, weeks or maybe a month, you know, uh, we probably will publish a lot more stuff, which you just didn't uh, know about as well, because you're the one who is writing our docs. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so a lot more information will be available. But I think even right now, there is plenty of information to check out and learn about what the next does. How it, uh, does it, you know? If you have an organization, you have a particular setup that's very tricky and the next doesn't work for you exactly, you know, open an issue. Uh, you know, and I will, or some, one of us, you know, will get back to you and we'll try to help you. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, blog on nrwl.io uh, and there's some content on there about NX, but there's also content about these patterns and stuff. Uh, you have a bunch of other posts that you've done up there for state right. management and things. And, right. and those posts, you know, uh, illustrate these concepts that are going into NX and going into these schematics and stuff. So th that's another great resource too, just to understand like where these opinionated things come from and what they're right. trying to solve. Sort of yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, check out those. Uh, we have a bunch of posts on the GRX, for example, uh, which uh, I highly recommend to check out because once you read them, you sort of see why in GRX is a, like a really reasonable option for like more steps, right? And uh, uh, a lot of uh, the ways we, you know, as you pointed out, you know, we generate in GRX stuff, uh, for example, uh, this the way we generate in GRX stuff is based on our experience. And the blog post, uh, blog post obviously cover our experience as well. Is there any example apps that are like blown out some like cat dating apps or something like that using <laughs> NX so that I can kind of like see what, you know, maybe I'm not ready to like switch my app into it, but you know, maybe I want to kind of see what it generates in like a real world example. Is there any like examples out there like that? All right. Uh, 
I think there is uh, at least one or two. Uh, like I believe if you uh, create a new workspace and you run ng-serve, uh, you will see a link to uh, an example app, right? And uh, or if you open the readme, uh, you'll see a link. But there is definitely an example app out there that is, uh, I mean, not real world-like, but you know, an app with stuff, right? Uh, we have a bunch of apps that we use uh, when we do workshops, right? Because we do workshops uh, on Annex, you know, with some of our clients. And uh, but those I don't think are out there. But you can, uh, you know, uh, hire us to give you a workshop, you know, and then you will see other apps. There you go. You could just make just, one, Austin. Just generate a new workspace. It's safer right. than crossing the street. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's very unlikely you will be hit by a car while generating a new workspace. <laughs> Not impossible, but very unlikely. Yeah, I think there's other people in the community too that are starting to do some stuff with it and try right. it out and, and share some things. And so I think that there's going to be other stuff that's surfacing. Mm -hmm. um, there's some app. I think some people put together some stuff with mm -hmm. uh, Ionic apps and stuff within the NX workspace and stuff like that. So. Right. Hey, do we have time for one more quick question? I know it's getting close to the top of the hour. What yeah, you mentioned. You mentioned GraphQL. How, how do you feel about, like, what, what's your opinion about databases? Does GraphQL work with NX, or is that a kind of a separate thing that doesn't really mesh well, or does it? Uh, I think it works well. Uh, so, like, first, uh, as a side note, you know, that many organizations cannot use GraphQL because it requires changes on the back end. That's usually a lot more uh, sort of impactful, right? And, and as such, uh, it may not be possible with a particular, in a particular organization. Right? If it is possible, and if you happen to have a backend team that uh, is already embracing GraphQL in a pool, let's say, right, and uh, they already have a GraphQL endpoint, right, uh, definitely use it. In which case, it is uh, compatible. Like NX in general is a, is a set of tools, right? Uh, like, things like workspace, routing, linking, and whatnot will work regardless of what state management strategy you use, right? The schematics we generate uh, will work somewhat with GraphQL. They won't be in a way. They won't help you to use GraphQL, so they won't make it much simpler, right? But they won't be in a way for sure. So uh, you can definitely use like an Apollo client. And right now, with the newest version, you can actually make it so it writes stuff into the your NGRX store. So you can still use NGRX and use Apollo together. You know, it it, it will work fine. That's awesome. Right. Okay. Cool. Do uh, any of our panelists have any other questions or anything before we wrap up? Want to get in there? Talk about stuff. We still have a few more minutes. We have more workshops. Yeah, our... Are you guys going to be at uh, what is it? Uh, I know you're going to be at NGConf. You're going to be at NG Atlanta coming up. Uh, no, we won't be. Uh, and the reason is uh, I'm just tired of traveling. Kind of that's, that's the reason. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're getting tired of living on the road. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I, I prefer not to, like I travel at, like at most once a month is, uh, these days. Uh, what would you recommend? Sorry. What would you recommend if if somebody starts playing with NX and they and they have questions they want to ask, just go on the GitHub. Um, yeah, I mean, if it's as, as, uh, I guess the the point if it's like a basic question like I'm trying to generate a component I cannot right, uh, then uh, I mean post it and uh, we'll be happy to help you right uh, answering sort of you know. Uh, questions like that. Uh, if the question is, I have this particular setup in my organization with five departments, and uh, there is a zip file, you know, can you sort it out for me? Uh, the, we'll probably won't, right? So, like, uh, if it's more like a question about the tool itself, uh, like, we'll be happy to answer your questions and help you out, right? Because you sometimes folks send questions like, Bob from the team over there, send me this zip file. Can you take a look? Like, who is Bob? Why are you messaging me? Where is the money? You know, like. Come on, right? Uh, but in general, yes. Post the uh, open an issue, uh, we'll help you out. What if they just want to argue with you about your opinions? Uh, I'm, uh, you know, the older I get, the less, like the less I enjoy arguing because I used to be in the arguing like a lot. Like it was my greatest joy in life. And later, like, do I really want to argue, or can I just sit by myself, like in a room in the dark, <laughs> and the latter? That's awesome. Nice. Cool. Uh, you mentioned uh, any cop. Oh, God, God. Yeah, uh, Bonnie, you asked about NGComp. Yeah, you get, yeah, you're going to have a workshop at NGComp? Right, yeah. Or a talk, or both. A workshop or a talk or both? Uh, we're probably going to do uh, 
uh, a lot of stuff with ng-conf. I imagine, like the workshop is a must, right? We are going to do a workshop in the next, which I think Justin is going to uh, do with either me or Jeff, you know, basically we'll be there workshopping about the next. Uh, it's going to be awesome. So uh, sign up, you know, while you still can. And uh, uh, we as a company will probably give a, like a few talks then uh, but we <coughs> still figuring it out. And I think we'll have stickers there, right? Stickers at right, at stickers. Yeah. And as a, another spot. Taffy. right? Yeah, Taffy as well. Yeah, I'm personally excited about NX um, for a what it provides and the structure that it provides for projects, but also because it's really the first extensibility that's been added on to the CLI and. I think more things like that are going to be coming, and thank you for pioneering that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, like actually, the CLI uh, is surprisingly extensible. There are a few things I'd like it to be even more extensible, but that aside, but even with what is there already, you know, you can actually do a lot of stuff and adjust how the CLI works or an X work in, the, in, in this case, because it's basically the CLI with a uh, different set of schematics uh, to match the needs of your organization better. Nice, nice. All right, well, we're near the top of the hour, so let's wrap it up. I don't know if anybody has any picks today, so why don't we just uh, kind of ad hoc it. Anybody who has any picks, just speak up and let those picks fly, and then we'll, uh, we'll call it good. I have a pick. All right, go for it. Uh, I was actually just uh, thinking about this, and you know, where can you learn more about NX? And I, and I kind of, uh, yeah, picking my own show, but uh, Justin Schwarzenberger was on talking about NX and demoing NX. Uh, so I don't normally pick NG Houston as my pick, but uh, if wait, you want to learn more about it. That Justin? That Justin? Yeah, right that there. Justin. <laughs> yes, that Justin uh, was demoing it and actually, you know, showed us what it looks like and fired it up. And and uh, so if you want to actually see it, uh, go watch that NG Houston NX episode. That's my pick. Cool. I'll, I'll back that pick. <laughs> All right. Who else? <laughs> I can give a look. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, you go. You go. <laughs> I'll jump in. I don't mind stepping on the toes. Uh, the the uh, videos from Angular Connect have been posted, so go free to check out uh, their Twitter, hand Twitter handle. They shared it. I also put in the show notes uh, to be able to check out that playlist. Cool. cool. Okay, uh, Alyssa. Okay. <laughs> I don't like this ad hoc thing, man. It makes me nervous. <laughs> Um, tonight, I was asked to be on the live stream um, that uh, Sasha Grief is doing on his survey results for the 2017 State of JavaScript survey. So um, it'll be a lot of fun, and the link is going to be in the notes. But yeah, so I'm only going to be on for like 15 minutes, apparently. So if you have questions, I guess get them in early, because I'll be like speed talking. So but yeah, that is all. <laughs> nice. Uh, do you have anything you want to pick today? Sorry, I don't know which Victor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you. You can go uh, first, Victor. Victor. <laughs> uh, I mean, all right, I'll go. Uh, does it have to be a technical pick, or can it be just a random pick? Whatever you want. All right, so uh, I have a bunch of non-technical picks, because uh, lately I was into non-technical stuff, right? Uh, a bunch of uh, books that I read uh, lately. Uh, one of them, which I liked a lot, uh, was a book called Debt, The First 5,000 Years, which is the history of debt and money. Uh, I heard about this book when I listened to an interview with Chomsky, and he like, is an anti-capitalist, very left-wing anarchist and whatnot. So I like, oh, that's interesting. So I read the book. Uh, like, it's an excellent book. It talks about like, the history of money, debt, you know, how it's all connected with war, slavery, empires, capitalism, you know, the end of capitalism. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I learned a lot. Um, so I recommend you to check it out if you're into uh, this kind of stuff. Another one would be uh, a talk by DFW, uh, David Foster Wallace, uh, called This is Water, uh, which I enjoyed immensely. I watched it actually a couple of times. It's basically his uh, lecture, I guess, about uh, the value of taking perspectives, the hardship of adult life, the aloneness we all feel in the world. You know, It's only 20 minutes, but it's like, really nicely done because he is a very eloquent uh, speaker, obviously. And I enjoyed it a lot. It's a little bit depressing, but you know, uh, he is always a little bit depressing, right? And the last one is uh, the book I read a couple of times, 
and it's called Letters from a Stoic by Seneca. In general, I like Stoicism. It's like my uh, personal favorite practical philosophy or whatever, something I live by. And uh, Letters from a Stoic is the most, I think, palatable, uh, like real book about Stoicism, right? Other ones like Meditations, but Marcus Aurelius is a little bit harder to read. So if you are into Stoicism or like you want to learn more about Stoicism, uh, I recommend you to check it out. Nice. Nice. I think uh, every time you've been on Angular Air, you have these awesome book picks at the end. So uh, everybody wants to up their literary game, like check out all the episodes that Victor's been on. <laughs> Get those picks. Awesome. All right, uh, Victor Mejia, do you have any picks that you want to throw in? Uh, yeah, uh, Kyle Simpson, uh, he's the author of the famous uh, You Don't Know JS books. He has a, a new book out, uh, Functional Light JS. So uh, check it out. It's free on GitHub to read, or you can purchase it on, on LeanPub. I uh, started reading a, a pretty good book. Nice. All right, uh, Austin, did you have anything? No, OK. No, no it's too so. short of a time between last Friday and this week for me to find anything. Cool. All right, well, we'll call it a wrap. Thank you to all of our panelists that joined us today. We had a big, long list. So that was awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Victor Safkin, for coming on and telling us all about NX. We really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Everybody have a good one, and we'll catch you next week. All right, cool. See ya. See ya.